Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a statement of how important um, we believe this is uh, to hear from Rabbi Perez uh, that uh, it would take time for Marcus Meres in order to, uh, to get together here to hear what he had on what his uh, works. Um, Rabbi Perez, first of all, Daron Perez is a uh, person who, um, aside from the events of the past uh, hundred plus days, um, is someone who's a uh, builder and uh, the head of uh, World Mizrahi, and he took an organization that's been around a long time, and to be perfectly honest, was uh, somewhat dormant for a long time, and has uh, revitalized uh, with his team uh, an organization, and he's been marvelous, uh, many, many things. Marvelous story, he helped us so much to COVID, open up, and uh, just been a, a real leader of the Jewish people in a very, very real way, um, through uh, World Mizrahi, but through other, uh, his, own, uh, his own works. And a, a real leader, a real leader of uh, Al Israel, and uh, really enabled us, Yeshiva, to do many, many things that we do. It's, uh, it's really a credit, uh, a tribute to him. Um, and perhaps, uh, you know, most important is, uh, you know, Rabbi Perez is, uh, on a very personal level, his family is, uh, is experiencing something, you know, we're all in this war, in a, in a, in a real way. Um, and we're doing our part, we do our best to do our part. Um, but Perez, more than uh, what you can imagine, more than I can imagine, is, uh, is in this uh, on a family level, I'm sure will tell you about it. I don't want to uh, you know, say more, you know, it's, his, uh, it's his story, it's his, uh, his experience. But it's something that uh, we all need to connect to, we all need to grow from. And I'm just very, very thankful for uh, Rabbi Perez for taking this very, very busy schedule, giving us some time uh, to, uh, to share with us. Uh, Time and time again, it's so beautiful. He says, on a high 
mountain, Alilah Melaser Zion, you go up there, Melaser Zion, the one who comes to Melaser, what is Melaser as we know, Sorot the Lord, Melaser is the person who brings good tidings. Brings tidings, but generally good tidings. Go up and tell Zion, Melaser Zion, that it's time for the redemption. Harini Bakoach, Kolech, lift up your voice, the one who is telling the Jewish people that it's time for a Sorah, good news for Zion. Vaser Jerusalem, Harini Al Zirah, Harini Arei Yudah Hinei Lachem. Raise up your voice, not only to the mountains of the Mount Zion, the mountains of Jerusalem, and lift up the voice of Geula uh, for the Jewish people. And therefore, from these mountains of Vaser Zion uh, emanates the tremendous words of the Zuk of Torah, the ultimate Torah for the Jewish people. Great Zuk for Zion. Rakuk explains that Zion is the more. We know that if you look at Tehillim. Uh, Yerushalayim is referred to as Zion more, more than Yerushalayim. Um, and throughout uh, Tanakh, uh, Yerushalayim is more than Zion, but these are the two names. We know that Yerushalayim, according to Chazal, has got 70 names. Chazal generally speak about the word 70. There's 70 nations of the world. Shivim Padilla Torah, there's 70 facets of the Torah. There's 70 names of Akhilj Barufu. There's 70 names of Yerushalayim. Kanire 70 is something which is all encompassing. But of the two, of the seven names of Shalim, the two of Fafar appear the most of Zion and Yerushalayim. And our book explains that Zion is more the physical city. Yerushalayim is a city. It's a city. And um, there's no other city like this in the world where it's a geographical city. I often think if God is telling Hashem, the Jewish people at Har Sinai, that they need to go on a bit of mission to be really spiritual. Yeah, they are in the middle of the desert receiving the Torah and he says, but I'm going to send you to another mountain. You'll know, we don't even know where Har Sinai is. I'm not sure exactly where it is. The Torah doesn't point out where it is. It's got no Kedusha after Matan Torah. But on that mountain, Hashem sends us to another mountain. And he says, you know, I'm going to send you to Makom Asher Yuchar. That, of course, mountain is Haram Oriyah. But eventually, the, the, um, the Shechina that rested that gave us the Torah at Har Sinai, his ultimate, its resting place is in another mountain um, called Har Hamoria, Har Zion, Har Abayt. And what's so strange is that of all the places Hashem chooses a mountain in the middle of the city, He says the place I want Mashkina to rest is not in a faraway mountain, not in Mount Everest, not in an ashram somewhere, a love deal, not in a place which is far away from people who get in your way and who disturb you, and it's a place where you can just quieten down and serve Hashem. But Hashem places his Shina within A, the capital city of the Jewish people, where the king sits, Yer David, in the king's palace, where the judicial capital is. Strangely, it seems Hashem puts the Sanhedrin in Ishkata Gazit inside the Beit Hamikdash. Really, is that the place for the Supreme Court to sit? Yes. Right by Makoma Shina, we need the Siyat of the Shina to assist us in ruling of what, how the Jewish people should rule. And therefore, it's not only the geographical center of the Jewish people, it's the it's the diplomatic capital, is Yerushalayim, that's where the king sits. It's also the judicial capital, that's where the Sanhedrin sits. It's also in the Bua emanates from, it's the spiritual capital. And of course, it's the Makom Hashkina, the Beit HaMikdash, in the middle of this, this bustling city. And our cook says, Sion, which is at Sion, which is it's a physical place. The word Sion comes with Sion, which is a Lahati Lekeber, is known as at Sion, because it's a place that's in Mitzayen, right? It's a physical place, Sion. But it's not only a physical place which gets redeemed through the rebuilt of Yerushalayim, it's also, of course, it's like the body and the soul. The body of Yerushalayim is Zion, and the soul is Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, the place of Yerat Hashem, the place of Shlemut. And, uh, and therefore, Mavaseret Zion, Mavaseret Yerushalayim, the Psora, that the Jewish people will return to their land and rebuild their country, and rebuild a, a, a country, a city, an economy, an army, place that can function as a functional society, but of course its essence is its Neshoma, its essence is Yerushalayim, its essence is the Shekhinah, and therefore for me I felt I couldn't but start to be in a place like this, with the Seret Zion, the Seret Yerushalayim, share that you should continue, Bezrat Hashem, to be Matmidim, uh, and to continue La Fitz, Torat, Zion, and so Unfortunately, our family, along with so many people, Klal Yisrael, had a very, very difficult Simchat Torah. We all know that Simchat Torah was such a difficult time, uh, such a difficult time. Who would have imagined that instead of dancing together, we'd have a place called Yad Binyamin, not far from here, 
we were unable to do our uh, our um, foot because the missile started <coughs> over at 6.30 in the morning. What time did they start? Yeah, similar time? Quarter to nine. Yeah, yeah. Were you able to do your hackathons? We did. Yeah. 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 We were unable to do it because we were just unable to do it. We're not all in one building and we were all over and we came to the shul and we were told to go home. Um, because they, yeah, so uh, it was, uh, you would have thought that uh, so many communities in Israel would have missed Simchat Torah, missed the overt celebration of the, of the, of the Simchat because of this unimaginable uh, thing that happened to us. It's just unimaginable. Who could have ever imagined that Otef Aza, the Gaza envelope, a place in Israel, would have become overnight the most dangerous place for Jews anywhere in the world since the Shoah? Who could have imagined that? That a place in Israel, a Jewish army, right? and a place I can tell you, both my son served in the Gaza war, which I'll speak about in a minute, they both said, Gaza, we've got covered. In fact, my son, when I spoke to him, Daniel, who unfortunately today is a hundred days of captivity. I'm normally very, very strong, but this morning I've just been having a really, really hard time. It's just been a very, very hard morning for me. You never know what uh, what evokes what. There's somebody who's doing a video about my son and he's been asking for two weeks to send pictures. So this morning I was just looking for all different pictures and different friends were sending me lots of pictures that I haven't seen. So this morning has been a particularly difficult one for me. It's also a hundred days, of course. Uh, to have a son in Captivity for a hundred days is just an unimaginable thing. The things which are more unimaginable. Some people have got daughters. Can you imagine? I can't imagine what it's like having a son. Can you, I can't imagine what it's like having a daughter. I can't imagine anybody. It's just unimaginable. And um, But both my sons, when I spoke to my son on uh, Erev Shabbat, Sh he was on the Gaza board, he's a, he's a tank commander. He was saying that it's, you know, Dad, it's so boring and quiet here. And he was always told he didn't enjoy the uh, the quiet. You know, he didn't come to arms to be quiet. And again, not that you want action, but you just it just felt so quiet. And he would always said that we, him and his uh, tank crew, were in a so what's called a tarhat, a big uh, military exercise in the Golan through the, the whole of support they train, because Israel's common wisdom said that the next war is going to be with Hezbollah. Hamas, we've got come. Yeah, they send over rockets every once in a while, and every couple of years we go in. But Israeli intelligence, it's hard to believe, was so blinded, it was so blinded, almost 50 years to the day, this is hard to believe, 50 years almost to the day, that in 1973, where the, the war, which was 2,700 people lost their lives, where Israel was so close to having the Syrians cutting Israel in half, we got so uh, caught by surprise. And famously, infamously, when there was a famous national commission led by the then head of the Supreme Court, it's known as the uh, run out commission and they famously they coined the expression which has become very popular very known in Israel and so many people wrote about it I've written about it and so many people written about it that why were we caught by surprise we were caught by surprise because of what they call the conceptia the conception we had a conception a perception which was wrong in short the perception went like this the perception in 1973 went like this Egypt will not attack Israel because they do not have enough planes and they do not have enough long-range missiles. Therefore, there is no way of them uh, uh, beating Israel. That's true. There was no way of them beating Israel. Number one. Number two, Syria will not attack Israel unless Egypt attacks Israel. Three, because Egypt won't attack Israel, Syria won't attack Israel, and therefore there won't be an attack. And every bit of evidence that came to show that we're planning an attack was dismissed by Israel's intelligence community. Why? Because of what they call conceptia. The concept is they're not going to attack. And the head of, he's 101 years old, head of military intelligence, then he's is 101 years old, and he was the one who was, uh, a lot of just picked on him, and he was the one who said there is no way they will attack. And the Americans agreed 100%. Henry Kissinger, who uh, just passed away, he was a Jewish foreign minister, uh, he is. Uh, was also part of his conception of a, a great uh, diplomat, he was American, um, what it's called, Secretary of State, is that what he was, Secretary of State? And he also said, he said after they attacked, he said they got this so wrong, why? Because their concept was people only attack in the war if they can win. It's a Western way of thinking. Western way of thinking, you don't go into a battle that you know you're going to lose. Because we don't fight for our cover. Fight for pragmatic reasons. 
questions. Um, so that's why I've said that for a year he was talking to her about the one who attacked and said this has got nothing to do with winning. They know that they're going to lose. They know they're going to lose, but this is to restore Kabul. After the six day war, we have to restore Kabul. And when we come back to the negotiation table, we'll come back as equal among equals without the zilzul of the Arab world. The Jewish jokes we tell about them, the shortest book of war, war books is the book of Arab victories, and all these zilzul that we had also towards Hamas as well. And for a year he was saying, this battle has got nothing to do with winning. I want to get into the ring with a heavyweight champion, and I know I'm going to get knocked out, but it's fine. I will show them that Altazal Zelbi, don't. I've also got a couple. And even if I get knocked out in round 10, but I went 10 rounds with you, and I even, I even knocked you down, and I even made you think, maybe, you know what, I belong in this place. And Henry Kissinger said this is the first time this mistake of Kissinger and of our leadership almost caused the destruction of the State of Israel 50 years ago when they said, Kissinger said, this is the first time that he's aware of in the history of warfare that a nation goes to fight knowing that they're going to lose. Well, welcome, Mr. Kissinger. You almost caused the destruction of the State of Israel because of your concept. And it wasn't just his concept, it was our military intelligence. It was our mistake, where we said they're not going to attack because they can't win. And Syria won't attack because Egypt is Egypt can't win. Everything is right, but it's wrong. And the same concept but from a different point of view happened. We've got all the defense in the world, we've got all the eyes in the world, we've got the best. We've been, Israel has been shrinking its military for 25 years. We've got a very small standing army and a very big reserve army. Why? Because Israel's military thinking has been got it covered. We've got all the fancy schmancy intelligence and send your kids to Shmone Maya, the Shmone Matai, and we've got billions of shekels that we put into defense. And therefore, we've got this one covered. There's more eyes in the Gaza border. I know when the first minivan came in, and my son, who's an officer, our oldest son, so I'll tell you about in a minute, he saw this minivan. His first thing was, it can't be from Gaza. There's no way. We've been told by all of us, there's no way. They can't get you. A fly cannot get past the space without being detected. There's more eyes in technology on the Gaza flimsy fence than any other place in the world. I don't want to talk about this concept because I want to talk about something else. But I just will say in the Hiaratz or Brian in parenthesis, one thing I've learned in life, and I don't want to get yeah, but some of the other things I want to share with you, is, but is this, is often in life we are not blinded by what we don't see, we are blinded by what we see. Blindness in life is not, you're not blind in life if you can't see. There are people of money in Islam, I've been there over 100 soldiers, this last 90 days who are, have been blinded, can't see either eyes. Over 100, I've heard this from a medical head who's in our community, who said there are 100 soldiers who have been blinded, this and this. And that's just something you don't even hear about in the news because of all the death and all the, the, the injured. Sometimes we can't see because Rahman is done physically, we can't see. But most of us, Lord Hashem, can see because we still get blinded, not because we can't see, but because we can't see. We get blinded because we look at reality and we think that what we see is the reality, but it's not the reality, it's our perception of reality. And we are blind about what we see because we think we see it so clearly, we can't hear another view. And Israel's military intelligence, that's what it did. I'll just give you one example of this. Yeah, uh, it says regarding Yitzchak, but Tichena in Avirot, Yitzchak was blind. But it doesn't say in the usual expression that Yitzhak was blind. It says, but his eyes were dim from seeing. And Rashi gives three explanations. Whenever Rashi is struggling with the Pshat, it's because why did it just say that he's blind? Why did it say that his eyes were dim from seeing? Rashi gives three reasons, but the Midrash gives lots of other reasons. I came across one this year when it says that Yitzhak couldn't see, and hence Yaakov was able to, with the with Rivka, to, to trick him. I saw that Rabbi Lazar in the Midrash, Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah says, Batichena ina mirot, he was blind from seeing, and he adds three words. Batichena mirot, two words. Baraato, three words. Baraato, shel, esa. He was blinded from seeing the evil in esa. <coughs> and whenever Rivka would say, but, but, but Yitzchak, can you not see that he's a murderer? Can you not see what he's capable of? He's a rapist, he's a murderer. All these things Rashi brings. And he's such an avancier. You're seeing things in his character which aren't there. And he can return. And according to Abazar and Isaiah, what was he blinded by? Yitzhak was blinded not because he couldn't see, because he could see. He could only see the good. Look, people turn out, well, could Hamas do this? Can, people, can they do the things that they just did? Yeah, we were blinded from seeing that they can. 
Sometimes we're blinded not because we can't see, but because we can see. There's a very famous midrash that Rabbi Benjamin says, Kulam bechizkat sunnah. Actually, all of us are blind. All of us are blind. And he brings a, 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 a proof from Hagar, which when Hagar is out in the, in the desert with uh, Ishmael, all of a sudden says that she sees the chemet, she sees the oasis, but she couldn't see it before. She opened her eyes and she saw it. She was there the whole time. All of a sudden she opened her eyes, but her eyes were open before. Our Rabbi Ben Yamin, Kulam Mechis Katsuma, we all blind. We all blind. I.e., we blinded because we see what we think is the reality. That's why we doubt the higher and name of the Torah Techa, that the Torah should help, help us open our eyes. To help us see things from a perspective of a broader perspective. Because we often look and we don't see. We are blinded by what we see. We were so blinded 50 years ago because we saw reality in a certain way and we were so blinded once again 90 days ago, 100 days ago, by what we thought we saw. But that's a whole other thing about blindness. Uh, I've got lots to say about that, but that's, I just wanted to touch on that. It's the blindness that allowed us to think that this border is got out of control. My sons, like men in the army, always, always training for Lebanon. Hamas, um, the Hamas uh, special forces called the Nukba are much weaker and less well trained than the Radwan forces of Hezbollah. And Hezbollah was always the battle. My son Daniel uh, is a tank commander, but he's uh, an officer, a tank commander. He always said that my tank, for various reasons, is going to be the first one to go into Lebanon. And always said we're training for Lebanon because that's what they were told. And here, as I say, in our weakest, against our weakest enemy, on this quiet border, this happened, there was a lot more to say, but on that day of October 7th, Simchat Torah Shabbat, where we were just so blindsided by what we thought we saw, um, we know that on that day, 1,200 people were murdered, mutilated, tortured in ways unimaginable. It really does seem that Yayit Ichya Sinwari Amachshamor, the military head of uh, Hamas, everything was pre-planned. They've been planning this for months and months and months. It takes time to find someone to burn people. It's not expedient. It slows you down. But it seems that part of their strategy was to cause us horror. To say, you think the Shoah is past? You think the Shoah is something of the past that we can't burn you? I know that the, the, a whole bunch of girls in the, the base that both my sons built in Nahal were not only burnt in the Hamal in the war room, they were guests as well. They were guests as well. And I know that for a fact, and uh, I'm in touch with the parents, and that's the one which took the longest time to, to uh, identify, the last soldier to identify with some of the girls in, uh, in, uh, in the Khamali Nakhbos, which I'll touch on. Um, amounts of burning families together, um, people alive, children alive, it's almost like Yamach Shemam, they wanted to come home and say, your biggest fear is that the Shah is behind you, it's not behind you. It can happen inside your country, it can happen when we want it to happen, where we want it to happen, on one of your happiest days, you think Yom Kippur is behind you, Yom Kippur will absolutely not. And who would have believed that the Tef Aza, the Gaza envelope, would have become overnight the most dangerous place for Jews in the world. Both of my sons fought in that area. 300 soldiers were killed on the first day, including 80 officers. 900 civilians butchered and murdered, as we know. And I'll tell you the following, that my, 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 my one son, Daniel, fought until 9.01 in the morning in his tank before his tank was over under Hamas. And at 9.27, he was defending the base called Nachal Oz, where he was based for Shabbat, where he was based for a number of months. His tank fell, which is the last sort of uh, protecting the base at 9.01. At 9.27, I know that the last soldier spoke, this girl I spoke to mother, spoke from the Hamal, from the war room of the base of 927. She lost contact and they, they were all uh, burned there afterwards. My son, my oldest son, Yonatan, led the first group of soldiers and officers into Nakhavos, the base, at 1 o'clock. That means from 927 until 1 o'clock, for those 3 hours and 3 hours and 33 minutes, that place was a killing torturing field, no less than Maidanik, and no less than Auschwitz, and any other place where Jews were burnt, and mutilated, and murdered, and gassed, and, and, and uh, but belating, belating, uh, of course, at one o'clock, things turned, 
my son and ten soldiers came in with him and they were able to take back the base and that's where he was unfortunately injured, which I'll speak about in a moment. But the first point I wanted to make is who would have believed that um, the Gaza envelope for maybe six to eight hours from seven in the morning, about I don't know, two, three, was the most dangerous place for Jews anywhere in the world since the Shu'an. It's almost like it's a page of uh, Holocaust literature. The pogroms, the Chumaniki massacres, the Crusades, all these things we read about in Kinot, right, all of a sudden just transports into today. Who could have ever believed that something like this would happen? Uh, both of our sons, uh, we have two sons we made earlier nine years ago from South Africa. I was privileged to be selected to be, I was a head of a, 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 a community and a head of a school and ran the, the really designer sort of organization, the Israeli. And I was privileged to be uh, nominated and selected to come back to Israel and to head the, the movement here. And uh, our sons at the time were 15 and 13. Daniel was, Jonathan was 15. And Danielle was 13, uh, we came back nine years ago, and our daughters were, were younger. We came back to Bilabinya and Benjamin, and thank God they integrated very well, besides, despite the fact that they're not easy ages to make Aliyah. They're both very sporty, and my boys, boys, because they, they integrated very, very well. They went to Yeshiva, my son went to Yeshiva for two years, and ended with the army, you know, through his dad, son Daniel went to Bakhina for a year, and went to the army. And they both really, really flourished in the army. They flourished incredibly. Jonathan uh, was his there and decided to continue his uh, paratroopers officer's course and then continued further to something called Kruisman Payne to be a company commander. He started on August 7th to uh, receive the new batch of new recruits of Pugat uh, Meabechad, the 101 unit in the base of new recruits where he's been training them eight months since August 7th. He was also on October 7th when Simchat Ray was engaged. He was introduced to a girl who's now his wife, um, Galia Landau, whose brother is what's called a Sangad, a deputy brigade, uh, brigade commander in the paratroopers who was an officer with my son. He introduced his, my son to his, his sister, and they were engaged to be married 10 days after Simchat Torah on board the Gibal Marcheshvan on the 17th of October. So that's Jonathan, who's at home with us. All of these soldiers are at home for Shabbat, and he's with us and his fiancée on that morning. Our son, Daniel, was in the for a year, he went to the army, he did incredibly well. Our son, Daniel, is the, he was the, the difficult kid to bring up, the impossible kid to bring up. He taught us about parenting one of these ADHD kids who couldn't sit for three seconds, unless he really wanted to sit, unless he was playing Fortnite or something, then he could sit for forever. I'm sure you don't know what Fortnite is, it's like a, like a horror, but not. But, um, um, so, if he wanted to do something, he could sit, during Corona, he organized himself a job that he was working for me straight to half Riyadh, and he somehow, he's a real, he was a, an operator, was able to release people from Bidur, from quarantine. He was like the most popular person in our sort of whole area. He would arrive with gifts. So this is for son Daniel. He released me and my daughter from Bidur. I said, Daniel, how you doing? He said, Dad. So all of a sudden, he brings according to the rules. And, um, and he was there for six months, and then he could sit because he became the king of Yad Benjamin. And anyone who needed to get out of Bidud, uh, he could uh, he could work it out and get them out of Bidud. So uh, Daniel was the, he's a kid who uh, you know it's one of these kids from a very very young age. We could see he was going to do whatever he wanted to do. I remember saying to my wife when he was three, I said, Baruch Hashem, I can see what this kid is going to turn out like whatever he wants to. He almost got no choice. I could just see that he could not make this kid do anything he didn't want to do. I saw when he was 12. I knew that he had won the battle. That are, he's going to do what he wants to do. He's a very, very honest kid, but a naughty kid. So what do you get if you get a naughty, honest kid? A kid who can't hide from you what he's doing. So he would come to me one day when he was told, and said, Dad, there's something I want to do. I know you won't approve, but I still want to do it. What's the punishment you're going to give me if I do it? I said, just run that by me again. <laughs> I said, Daniel, you're not going to do it. He said, Dad, that, that's my choice. I said, it's not your choice. It's my, my choice is my dad, it's your responsibility as a parent. You're going to do what you're going to do, I respect that. I'm going to decide. I said, Daniel, it doesn't work that way. He said, Dad, it does work that way. I, I promise you, I was like, I wanted to throttle him. I said, Daniel, you are not going to do it. He said, Dad, Dad. He said, 
That's my decision. <laughs> you can just decide what the punishment is. And then I'll decide if it's worth my while to do it. He said, you should be lucky that I'm telling you that I'm not going to do it. I was seething. I went home. I went to my wife. I said, no, no, just get up and teach him. I come back the next day. I can't even remember. It's, uh, he so beat me into submission, I can't remember what it was. So I came back the next day and I said to him, I gave this massive punishment. I can't remember what it was. He said, yeah, are you serious? He said, you've just taken my free choice away. He said, you've given me such a crazy punishment that no person's going to do it. He says, go back and think about it again. <laughs> he says, again, you're diplomatically forcing me to do what you want to do. But I need to decide that. I said, you're not done yet. It doesn't work that way. He said, Dad, it does work that way. It does work that way. Go back and think about it again and come back with a punishment that matches the crime. I can't even remember the crime that paid. At that point, I realized it actually doesn't matter. I said, you know, do what you want to, whatever it is. And I've got, I've got lots of stories like that, but I can tell you what I'm sure. As he matured, he, uh, he shivered and in the army, he became such, uh, as I said, Daniel's the type of kid, if he doesn't want to do something, nothing will make him do it. If he wants to do something, nothing will stop him. And I've got so many examples, which I'll, I'll maybe just share one other one with you. One other one with you. Daniel, uh, there's a man, some of you might know about Carney Gross. Carney Gross, the son of the famous of Alexander Gross, who's the famous mechanic in America. Rav Carney was our consultant in Johannesburg on our curriculum in school, on, on our Hebrew curriculum. And his shita was to teach you, um, to teach you Shorashim. In, in primary school, in like grades three to six, you would learn 500 basic Shorashim. And through that, if you had these 500 mastered, you would understand much to it because everything revolves around these 500 words. So that was the shita. And at the end of the year, we had a quiz, or what I think you call it, the feed in America. So I a quiz. So of course, I was there at the school. I said, Daniel, we're going to do the quiz. It was very cool. And I said, no, there's no problem there. We studied for six weeks every morning before school, every afternoon, everything like that, non stop. Um, to cut a long story short, I mean, we learned just the inside out, backwards, everything became second. The following year, Five days before the quiz, we didn't learn at all. I was going my life and I had a virtual he says, Dad, uh, I'm thinking of doing the Shurashim quiz. I said, Dan, it's in five days' time. And he started learning now. He says, What do you give me if I win? What? What do you what I give you if I win? He said, What do you give me if I win? I would have given him anything because I knew I know how hard I learned for six weeks and became second. There was no way. He put a number on the table. He always liked a good bit. He put a number. I said, Dan, I'm not giving you money. He said, Dad, just. We negotiated and put it on the table. We went away, my wife and I, for five days for our wedding anniversary. I get a call from the head of Judaic Studies. Muscle told Daniel won. I said, Daniel won what? The quiz. I said, what quiz? The Shurashim quiz. He didn't do the Shurashim quiz. He did. And he won. He cannot be. He cannot be. And then I get a call from the kid who beat him last year's father. I said, amazing, your son was untouchable. I said, I don't know what happened this week. I said, Daniel, what happened? He said, Dad, last year we did it for you. This year I did it for me. You've got to talk to me in my language, you know? And this is the skill. If you talk to me in his language, nothing can stop him. And I really hope and pray, I hope and pray that this Kwakrat son, that person that is alive and well, and this Kwakrat son will stand in good stead. He then, the army brought out the best thing. Daniel, the type of kid was either going to go to the army, go the low road or the high road. And he went the highest possible road. He I was actually seen very difficult to read, though, but. Uh, I saw, you know, they sent back from his base, um, you know, whatever stuff they found from the base. And one of them is a diary that I hadn't seen before. I haven't been able to uh, look at any of the stuff they sent back. Just tell him if this is that, they haven't been able to look at anything. And uh, but my son, all the son and daughter, said that, said, Dad, you should look at the, we'll take it out and put it on his desk and you'll, you'll get a lot of physical from it. And just to see what a, a mensch and how just mature and he writes wise in the army sort of being in the army is and, uh, and, and he goes you know he, he writes all the um, all the targets he set to himself every day he said the aim in the army is to be able to defend the people of Hashem to defend the Jewish people and he said I and my crew have to be ready for war to break out at any moment and everything we're doing here is at the moment that happens, we have to be ready and all the time he's working on this one needs more motivation this one needs this I need more that this one needs this it's constant desire to be the best that he can be, and he was considering doing what's called a crucible campaign to be a company commander, 
um, further, and he really, really just brought out the absolute best in him because he chose it, he wanted it, and it was unbelievable to see. And both of our sons became very, very close. They were close, but very different. We became very close through Aliyah to Israel and through army together. And our, our oldest son, uh, so this, uh, that's Daniel, our oldest son, Yonatan. I'll just take you through quickly what happened on October 7th, September. Eight o'clock in the morning, our son, uh, eight o'clock in the morning after the rockets been home over an hour and a half, our son Yonatan gets a WhatsApp from his uh, commander to all the officers saying something's going on, you need to come. So off he goes, he didn't even have his gun with him, he left his gun in the base, which he never does, but he did with Simchat Torah and Kapot Shniot, but he left with his handgun and my other son's handgun, and basically to cut a long story short, uh, he phoned us at the Hopos Hall from Sirocco Hospital in Beersheba. Uh, it was Shabbat. He, the rabbi said we can put our phones in Shabbat because there was also a security concern in our area. But my phone was on, but I didn't look. And I wasn't worried. I really wasn't worried. I thought, what could possibly be going on? I didn't understand why they needed my son to go down to the south. It just didn't make sense to me. He's training new recruits. I thought they were overreacting. I didn't know what was going on. At 4.30, the phone, my wife's and my phone rang non-stop about half an hour from all different numbers. And we realized obviously something's happening. I answered the phone and he said, Dad, I've, uh, he just, I'm, just, I'm okay, I've been shot in the thigh, it's, but I'm okay. And straight away, you know, the son says, you're okay. I said, uh, are you sure? You know, if it goes in the thigh, you can bleed to death. It's one of the most dangerous places to be shot is in the thigh. It's the main artery there and uh, you can bleed to death. And if you don't put what's called the tourniquet on in the right place in 90 seconds, you can bleed to death. So, um, um, he said, no, Dad, I think it's okay, but like three things. He said, I can't explain to you what's going on. I cannot tell you what's going on yet. It's just you have no idea of how many people have been killed and butchered and murdered and we're in the middle of something crazy, number one. Number two, when I fought in the Chalos at one o'clock, I went in, Daniel's tank was not there. He said, I think that's a blessing because you have no idea what the space looked like. And uh, if anybody was in that base after 9.27, they, they, uh, it, was, it was terrible. Thankfully, there were some girls in the base who managed to hide in different bushes and that, and they didn't look for them there. They actually managed to survive. Our son and his crew uh, uh, saved about 20, 21. Uh, uh, you know, anyone who's in the buildings anywhere was just uh, butchered and murdered. But uh, it's managed to save them. And he said, I think it's a good thing that we don't know that don't Daniel's in his tank because his body's okay. And he also then thirdly said he's very really concerned about his wife's, his fiancé's family who live in Kibbutz side which is on the border. He didn't know at the time that they didn't manage to get into Tikkut side. It's on the other side of the road from Kvar Aza. And uh, there was an absolute, uh, 400 terrorists in Kvar Aza. It was an absolute bloodbath in Kvar Aza. Uh, one of the worst places hit. But thankfully they didn't manage to get into, uh, uh, into um, side, which he didn't know at the time. So um, by the end of that day, we went to the hospital. We took him home. It was 12 o'clock in the night because thankfully the bullet went in and out of his leg. It didn't seem to do anything major. He couldn't feel his leg, but we phoned our doctor. They didn't have a bed for him. They didn't have crutches for him. They didn't have a wheelchair because the, 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 the hospital was totally overrun uh, of injured. So we decided to bring him home and had a nurse and the doctor treat him at home where he was there. But we still had no contact with Daniel, uh, which is what they called Nutaka Kesha. Unfortunately, we're now 90, 100 days and still not touch Keshe. We've had no, no contact with him and, and no nothing which is where about some uh, The next day came and done it 24 hours later. Now we're really starting to get worried, really worried. Uh, what are we going to do? You know, we don't know where he is. What, we thought maybe with the Balagam going on in the army that he'll be okay. Maybe he's still fighting. <coughs> Four o'clock that afternoon, my son was phoning everyone he could phone because he fought in the same area. And eventually spoke to somebody who said no. He saw somebody who said that they, one of his soldiers went to the tank, saw the tank. There's one dead in the tank and three missing. He said, "Is the dead person in the tank the officer?" They said no. So we knew that thankfully he hadn't been killed, but unfortunately he was in harm's way. It was a very very difficult moment. Um, my, my younger daughter Shira, she said that it was the first time she ever saw both me and my older brother cry. It was very very difficult. We went to tell my wife, which was a very, very difficult half an hour. But that was the moment we realized that uh, he's in harm's way. And the best case scenario is he's alive with Hamas. I mean, we thought maybe he's hiding somewhere, but I know my son is here. He's not going to be hiding anywhere. And um, um, so that was then. Um, so we had the reality of a son injured. Thankfully, 
moderately to likely have a home and save, and another one probably may have a Hamas. Only on um, Thursday did the army come to us and tell us that officially Daniel is, uh, is missing. I said, what does that mean? So I said, it means that we don't have a body, thankfully, but we have no idea. Um, we just don't know where he is, meaning we've got no um, testimony, we've got no uh, videos, we've got no pictures, until today. Um, so we had a decision to make now. Uh, we have Daniel who's missing, officially. We have Jonathan injured, but he's got a wedding in five days' time. We didn't know what to do. And I think the thing which prodded us to make the decision was his, Jonathan's commanding officer came to visit us on the Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, and he told us how brilliantly that Jonathan fought, he fought in steroids, and then a place called Sovetak Shantot, and then a place outside Karaza Saad, a place called Medchet Shachor, where when him and the Jeep in front of him were going past this memorial site, uh, a RPG missile was shot at the Jeep in front of them, and three Magellan soldiers were killed, two officers and one other one, and our son's Jeep had went straight over their heads. And then they opened the doors and started shooting, and the guy next to him, uh, also a company commander, got shot in the stomach. And they took him away, and my son, as they were taking him away, he took his gun, because he didn't have a gun, a proper gun, and took somebody else's helmet, and took someone else's vest, and that's how they fought, until eventually he went into uh, fire into, um, into Mutsav, the base called Nachal Ozwe. He was the first person into the base. He was the only one of the officers who knew the base, and therefore he led him into the base. And he was a uh, quarter to three uh, shot in the thigh, and the person next to him shot in the back and in the knee. And the person on the other side shot in the stomach. Thank God they all survived, some of them worse injured than others. And just by the grace of God, uh, Yonatan was survived, survived. And we heard all of this not from Yonatan, but from his commander. And then his commander says to him, says to him, Yonatan, Yonatan, no, it's Chachatuna, Ucham Shashanim, you're supposed to get married in a few days' time. What are you going to do? He says, Niloida. So I said to him, Fakir, what do you say? He says, Mani Omer, Ani Omer, Titchaten, Ayom Bayerev, get married tonight. Ala Madim Shilcha, put your uniform on and get married. He says, Ha'ab Shilcha Rab, your father, everybody knows what to do, bring a few aid in. He's a traditional guy from Tel Aviv, and he says, There's so much death and destruction. Ani Shil Sarich Simcha. That's what he said. So when I heard that, I said to him, Fakir, is it a command? He said, No. So I said, Then I said, The Nyanath is not going to do it. But I did know that that for me was the first time, that, you know what, maybe it's not crazy with all the funerals going on and all this shock and everything. Maybe it's, maybe it's even the right thing to do. I phoned uh, one or two of my rabbonim that I'm close to and they said, look, if you can go ahead and you've got to it would be a good thing to have a long short. As painful as it was, we decided once we knew Daniel was missing and would be missing at least for a couple of weeks, we decided it was my big concern was to go ahead with the wedding and then it's a funeral and we didn't really know what to do. But, um, but once we realized we'd be missing for a few weeks at least, until there's more information, so we canceled the wedding ball in, in Ashkelon, and we had a small but beautiful wedding in Yad Benjamin, where we live, and the ladies of Ayesho, my wife's friends, just organized an unbelievable wedding. So my reflections, I want to give a little bit of time for questions. Maybe I'll just give you two or three quick reflections, and then um, some time for questions. Reflection number one. The first thing that I spoke about after the wedding, I had a few interviews. For the first nine days, or ten days, I just, you know what I mean, it just it was crazy. I didn't, uh, couldn't really talk to anybody. I didn't have anything to say as well. But after the wedding, when we had sort of things had settled, our son was married, and our other son missing, uh, so I could try and sort of reflect on what we were going through. My first reflection, I'll just, I'll share just two reflections with you, and then I'll leave it open for questions. And feel free to ask whatever you want to. The first reflection I had was, I realized that, the following. I realized that no matter what curse and challenge you have in your life, it should not cancel out the broker. I know that our son Yonatan could have been killed and could have been, uh, could have been injured so much worse. I have a friend, a good friend of Ashmul Slotty, who lost two of his sons on the day. Two of his sons, and I'm in, in, in China, were killed on a first day. I know that things could have been very, very different. But my wife said, you know, we've done it so hard in Yom Kippur. I should have our prayers. I said, he did. He asked our prayers regarding Yonata. And hopefully he asked our prayers regarding Daniel. He really, 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 it could have been very, very different. Yonata. And I realized that just that you've got so much color and challenge in your life doesn't mean it passes out the blessing. And I realized an incredible thing at the, at the wedding. I was very worried about the wedding. We would be able to 
have genuine simpler. We didn't want a simpler to be marred with pain and difficulty. And I had made a decision on the day that I'm going to end the wedding. I'm not going to think about Danielle. It wasn't the most mature decision, but for me, I thought I'm going to come and I'm just going to focus on your time. And as the wedding started, <coughs> uh, the Salaam um, Public Commission did what he should have done. He said, you know, we can't start the wedding without acknowledging Danielle and Martinez. He sort of spoke about it. Daniel's presence, which was missing, his absence. It was very, very difficult. Maybe that and Kuflamet, Tim Kuflamet, we all cried. It was very, very difficult. But I realized that you can cry for two or three minutes, you can get it out, and it can be an immeasurable pain. And you can wipe your tears away, and you can put that similar, that, that pain in the background and have an incredible symptom. My own friends, she said that the symptom was the most holy, saddest, happiest, most inspiring wedding she was ever at. But I can tell you it was a happy wedding. There were two or three moments, three minutes under the hood of tremendous pain. Family pictures were difficult for a few moments and one or two other things. But the 95, the wedding was an unbelievably happy wedding. It was incredible. The background music was Daniel's lack of presence, but the music itself was the wedding for Yonatan. It was an unbelievable seminar. When I reflected on it, I came up with a chidush for myself. Unfortunately, taught through the pain of life. But I realized that it is possible for the human heart to experience immeasurable pain and happiness at the same time. And the Siyat Dishmaya, to acknowledge the pain and put it away when you need to. It made me realize that when we read on Sukkot in Kohelet, where Kohelet says that whilst all in Shlomo Miller says in chapter 3 in Kohelet, he says, for me it was a chidush. He says, the false man by eight, but a full head is not the mind. For every season and time, they're different sentiments. He says, eight, la mut, eight, the time to die, time to live. Eight, la tat, eight, la kora, time to plant, time to fruit. Eight, the schok, time to laugh, for eight, the kot. He goes on and on and on and on, the time for war, time for peace, all these categories. I always thought that Shlomo Amelech was talking about different periods of time. The time for this and the time for that. This made me realize in this extreme circumstance that maybe what Shlomo is saying is that sometimes in life it's a package deal. Hashem gives you everything at the same time. The wisdom of life is to know when to put something down and when to put the other thing up. For instance, if you're at a wedding, it made me realize at a wedding, I don't know if there's one person who's ever stood under their hook of a parent who doesn't eat a god but have a parent not their grandparent, a sibling not their uh, God who's lost somebody else in the family, who's got sickness in the family, who's got something in Shalom Bait, she says, everyone's got something that you call upon when you stand under the hookah to acknowledge it and put it away. In different degrees. Because this is an AP sok. Every time of life is an AP sok, but at this time when it's an AP sok, it's the sort of you can't take the difficulty and put it away. Acknowledge it and put it away. And when you go into a shiver house, it's exactly the opposite. Shiva house is a time we've caught. But sometimes you go into a shiva house and you don't feel like crying. You've got a lot of blessing in your life, you've got a lot of brocha, you're not the one who went through a loss. And there the Abulat Hashem is to take the simcha that you have, take the akarat of talk that you have, take the preacher, take all of the blessing and put it away. And come in with an open heart of what's called Nosei Volim Chavero. Come into a shiva house with a heart where you can hopefully take away an aota of the person's pain by being empathetic, by being present, by being with them. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to say anything. You're so not used to being empathetic. We just come and bring your heart there and try just to shoulder some of the person's pain. But it requires a lot because you have to take all of your mind talk and all of your blessing, all of your autobiography and put it away. And maybe Shlomo Melech is saying that in life to get through things. The wisdom of life is not thinking childishly that, you know, there's good times and bad times, and those times and those times, no, it's often all together. But what you need to do in these times, you've got to know what occasion to bring out the most appropriate sentiment. That, for me, has been the biggest learning. I've got lots and lots and lots and lots of things to share with you, but I'm going to open time for questions. But it is that I think the human heart is capable of incredible strength. I think Hashem gives you this not that you cannot stand up to but then he gives you the path to stand up to them. And that's what I wanted to share, and I have many things to say. Yeah. So how would Daniel want to go about her life? Like, what would he want to do? What would he, what would he want to think? Um, I don't know. Um, 
first go up and pray that he's alive. And um, uh, for me, when people say to me, um, like I've had a few interviews where people say, you say something to Daniel, what would I say? So firstly, what would I want to say to Daniel? What I want to say to him, I hope and pray that he's alive and that he's well. And just to say to him that, uh, and maybe I'll ask the question as well, that um, I said, I'll say to Daniel, you have no idea how many people are done. You have no idea how many people have come together in our family, in our extended family, in our friends, in our community, in, community, in South Africa, where he's from, so that all the kids in South Africa, they made these things because you know, where they all been wearing his name on from South Africa. And people around the world, whenever I speak, I ask you, we can ask you as well, please to dub him for Daddy El Shimon. His Hebrew name is Daddy El Shimon. Ben Sharon, somebody said a nice way of remembering it, that it's uh, both uh, Daniel and Shimon are two characters who were in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in prison and got out. Daniel in the lion's den, and Shimon, who was the, the brother, was imprisoned by Yosef. And they both got out, so we hope and pray that he will get out. So there's other Shem, the Riyuts, and I will put that question. And my wife's name is Shem, it's Sharon, Daniel, Shimon, and Sharon. I just want to add that unfortunately we've heard five weeks ago that our son was also injured, and found part of the blood. Unfortunately, his blood was also very, very hard, and it's just in the tank. And thankfully, it's not enough blood which changes any definition, so please God is uh, alive and well, but it's still very, very hard to receive that. So it's also to have a pleasure of quite a book, and quite a mentor, and to. So I think, for me, I, don't, I think what it would be, it's, it's sort of, it's hard for me to think what would be what. It's hard for me to think like that. I don't know. Um, want us to get him out, obviously, and I think that the way to do that, each one of us is now, you know, there are over 130 hostages still, which is unimaginable, two children, it's a kid, a few of us who just turned a year old last week, and another, his old brother Ariel was four years old, and 15 women still, and the, the rest of all men of all ages, and um, I would say that, um, that we all do our bit, and you know, when I say to my, and I speak to my and Danielle, you are you're not alone. You're not alone. So, thousands, not tens of thousands, but hundreds of doubling for you, with you, doing it's good for you, and all of the hostages, the whole people is united around trying to get you out. And everyone, you're not alone. And be just be strong. Be strong and uh, just you can. You get you get put in impossible situations, but you can. So I think for me, what I would think that you would want, what we want is just to, you know, to please just dub and watch our spot a week if you can have the hostages. We have our son Daniel Shimon in mind. This is literally part from the Shoah we're living through where, I mean, nothing compares to the Shoah, but that you've got 132, 136, I'm not sure, you know, hostages from little children to elderly men and women uh, who just are being held in God knows what type of conditions. Um, to do whatever we can to send his opinion to God, to David for them to have the hostages in mind when you burn. Of course, all the soldiers, of course, that uh, all the soldiers, of course, because none of us, God forbid, want anyone God was having to die to bring our kids out. So that all the soldiers should be well and healthy and all they should come back. So for me, it's that whatever we can do to strengthen ourselves now with our Hashem, firstly in our tefillot of Nosei Bon Kamero, that we all feel. That is, I think, what this thing has done is brought Kali's well together. Uh, I can tell you the the amount of interaction there is, I don't know if you've heard about the Tefillah at the Kotel, I mean that's the first time I've ever seen a Tefillah at the Kotel like that, but in terms of the numbers, I've been at times a bit more numbers, but I've never seen a Tefillah, like in the Slichot it's mainly Svarim, and Yom Shalayim it's mainly the Dantilo we will, and other times it's mainly the Haredi will, it's the first time that I've seen the Chief Rabbi of Israel together with the hostage uh, forum, which are mainly left wing secular Jews because the majority of people taken captive off of those should be coming together out in the system without every organization supporting it. I've never seen across the board such unity for Tfilah. And so that the hostage square is also more and more there's a big tish there last night with two Koshabarabonim. And it's slowly I think uh, what this has done, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't talk to solidarity groups from around the world. The thousands of hundreds of solidarity groups coming and the unity within Israel is an unbelievable just such a so sad that we needed Hamas to bring us together and remind us who we are and remind us of two things how we prepare to how our young men from all across the world are prepared to put themselves online to save uh, people that I know to save the Jewish people 
And secondly, it's brought out incredible unity, which we hope and pray will stay. So I think whatever unity of hearts there is, that people can, you know, we only now started to publicize his picture. We didn't do it for the beginning because he's an officer and a solar army told us to sort of, you know, but we do feel all of the soldiers' parents have got together. We all started to publicize the pictures and that, uh, they know who they've got, they told him I would text know exactly who they've got. I don't talk about what he did because I don't want him to get him back to anyone, but he fought very, very bravely and saved lots of different people. And that's for another discussion hopefully when he comes out to the live and world is on the ship. Uh, after three weeks they changed his definition from missing to presumed that captive because of various things they found, but not conclusive. Uh, but he's probably there. And even of all the hostages who've come out, uh, none of them have seen him. There's only one person, one soldier that I'm aware of that uh, hostages have seen. One soldier, all the others, uh, you know, the, 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 everyone who's come out are civilians, or civilians have seen civilians. But I'm not aware of civilians seeing soldiers, I'm the one that I'm aware of, and unfortunately not outside. Um, so I think it's that, I think this feeling of, you know, when we dive in every day, the result says before you dive, you should cover on yourself to accept the midst of our and the buffer of And I think having 130 hostages, plus all ages and backgrounds, plus soldiers of all across Israel daily putting their lives on the line. It's just brought the sense of brought us together. And just to, to deepen that, to through this you know, concern for others through Tvila and through uh, just dubbing for them and setting, you know, to them. There's obviously your learning as well. The learning could be uh, in some way uh, also dedicated to their well-being. Uh, Torah, loving our months today, the Torah. The question is, was uh, was our mind not I don't know why. I don't know why. For me, it hasn't challenged me when I was only built it. I don't know why. I'm not suddenly like anyone else. I don't know. I don't, I don't think you ever know how you're going to react to this. Um, for some reason I've reacted very calmly, I don't know why. I don't know why I'm actually calm, I mean I was often in a lot of pain, but I don't know why this hasn't it's really made me firstly feel incredible like I have to talk to Hashem because of Yonatan. I know that things will be different Yonatan. I've seen it with friends of mine, so I have incredible Hakarat to talk that things happen the way they do with him. And also I hope I hope the friend is only a kind of people don't know. And for me, I think relative, you know, if you're living in life, depends what you compare it to. You compare it to everything wild, well, then how come this is happening to you? Then compare it to what other people have been through, you're lucky in some ways. So it's the famous story of Zusha. You know, there's lots of stories in Hazal where, you know, you know, that in life, most things happen in our head. I often say that if you look in a world, we, we need to choose. I was with a certain uh, uh, journalist. I'm trying to say that I can't believe it. And she said to me, but Rabbi Perez, when you put your pillow, your head in the pillow at night, and you've just got you and your thoughts, right? And it's very nice all your nice brushes you get with the button. What do you feel in that moment? And I said to her, in every situation you can choose your thoughts. Yes, sometimes they get the better of you, and, and it's like the wave which runs through you, and you have to cry it out, and it's painful. And sometimes you can't, but it's like a wave I've seen waves are called Mishvarim, Mishvareya. They break, every wave eventually breaks. And even the pain comes, Gamziya or so when it comes, it washes you out and it's so painful, but it passes, it passes. And I said, you know, I think we do have the power to choose our thoughts. And uh, the one place that I learned it from in the Torah, it's very famous where um, in Parashat Kitavo, uh, all of the Klalots, all the Tosacha, it says, why do all of these things happen to us? You know, the chat, why do these things happen to us? All the fellows that says, because we don't serve Hashem, right? You know, even if we're tied to that, we'll be. But then, it's turned the on its head by an incredible system. goes to all the fellows. And then it says, why does this happen to you? Tachat Hashem, Ravadat Hashem, Rokecha, because you don't serve Hashem, God. The Sikha, who took the Abba, the Rokho. Because it didn't only happen because you didn't serve Hashem, you might have served Hashem. <laughs> but it doesn't say this. It says, because you didn't serve Hashem, not full stop, you didn't make me serve Hashem. But you served Hashem, not with simcha and not with contentment. And 
how do you do that? Service of Hashem, not the contentment that simply is not us. It's, it's not service of Hashem. I say I learned from that if you live in a world, if you think you live in a world of curse, then you do. Curse is first and foremost brought on by what we think. If we think everyone else is out to get us, they are. If you think things are so bad, then they are. And you're always comparing your life to what others have, then you live in a world of curse because you've chosen that your that your um, yardstick is that everything is supposed to be okay and I deserve. I don't I never use the word deserve. I don't know what the word deserve means. Deserve. You don't deserve anything. Not for good and not for bad. We live in Hashem's world. And in Hashem's world, things are just the way they are. It's one thing I've worked very, very hard on in my own life that Hashem is known as Hayal Bebiyah. It was useful. That's what Hashem is. Hashem is reality. And our Avodat our, our, our Hashem is to be in the moment, yes, to draw strength from the past and plan for the future. But then live. The only moment we have in life is this moment. The only thing I know for sure is that I'm alive. Now, in half a second, I've no idea what's going to be. No one knows. No human being knows. And even the greatest of the being can predict the future because it depends on so many things of children and other things. None of us know what's going to be. The only thing we know is that we have this moment. And for me, I worked very hard that I have this moment. I've also chosen, I don't always manage not to think about what my son might be going through. I've chosen that. I don't listen to any of the stories of torture. I don't listen to them. I've chosen not because I said, what is it going to help? If God forbid things happening to me, what does it break me as well? Does it make me close to, to be broken as well? So I've chosen, first of all, part of activism. My son's a South African citizen. Now we're very, very hard behind the scenes. The fact that it's close to Hamas for us is good. It's good because there's an open channel there. I'm not going to detail anything. There's always a silver lining in the craziest things. And I'll do anything, everything, and travel anywhere around the world to turn the world upside down to get him out. Whatever I can, as any parent would do. As any parent would do. Um, so I've chosen to focus on, and I don't always get it right, but to focus on what I can do to get him out, on Abu I need to speak where I can, to give him and get his and ask people to dub it for him, to do everything we can, to him to dub and do it spot for him and other hostages. And for me, uh, I don't know why it hasn't it's built my faith and not, uh, you know, and not, um, I have no timers in Hashem, no timers. Can I say, because I've been thinking, you know, there's a Mishnah, and maybe I'll end with this, or maybe one of the Rosh Shiva, because I'll see the Rosh Shiva's question. Um, there's a Gemara in Masechi Brachot, the Mishnah, which says that a person is supposed to make a brachot on the bad, just like you make it with I always found that part, can a person really with a full heart? You know, Rabbi Akiva could say, whatever I should have been, the word. Can I, I can say it here, can I say that no matter what is happening to my son, no matter what happens, can I say for my kishkas, it's for the good? I don't know how to say that. But I'll tell you what I can say. I can say no matter what happens, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. We live in our ship's world, and our ship's world, everything's okay. For the good, but I can't. For the sun in this situation, I can't. I can say it here, but not here. But you know what I then realized? I realized that when it says that you have to make a brocha on the bad, like you're making the good, what's the brocha? The brocha you're making the bad is not at all. Hashem could never ask us, no matter how, what madrega we are, to say on oh, terrible things happening to us now until my tip. It's terrible, it's not good. Yes, the Hashem does for the good, but we don't experience that the Torah was given to Malachim, it was given to Benadam, and I can't expect a Benadam to be in the devil who's going through such pain and say, yeah, everything Hashem does is for the good. And therefore, the bracha is, and that I think I can say, no matter what, for the perfect God, for the Ruta, and I Which means, Hashem knows what he's doing. Even if it's not good for me right now, and even if I know, Intellectually and spiritually, it's good, but I can't say that from here. But I don't believe Chazal wants us to say that from here. They want us to say, Hashem knows what He's doing, and no matter what happens, we live in His world and not our world. I can accept it. I can accept it, and no matter what happens, we'll be okay. And that's how I'm processing it. I feel like all the things I've done as a rabbi with people, it's now my time to make you believe it. And I'm thankful to Hashem, as, as painful as it is, is that He's at the moment giving me the Kofot today, but I don't need to deal with it. I just want to thank you for your coming and uh, it's personally more than the way it changed and I'm positive and I hope uh, I'm sure there is some issues as well. So
personal desire if you were to have all the hostages you signed on yellow come back. The national means of uh, crushing and destroying this enemy, not giving away more terrorists and prisoner exchange. How does the father deal with that? She was asking a very, 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 very important question on Bible and briefing. You know, I think when you go through things like this, you call the cops to try to deal with this with all the reservoirs of Quark and everyone that you've got. One of the things I've believed in for a long time, I'll end with this, is in life, you have to have the ability to deal with complexity. We wish life was simple that you could only get through one eye. That's perhaps why she uses two eyes, right? If you close one eye, you see the world, right? But you see it without depth. If you close the other eye, you see the world without depth. It's only when you see both eyes that you see with depth. There's two problems we've got. You know, we've all got a blind spot. Even when we see the things we don't see. And if you need both eyes, you'll be a better chance of seeing. And when you see with both eyes, you've got depth. And when I put in this position, I want to kind of be put on the spot, especially with some of the other hostage families. But I've got along with all of them, you know, to say it like this, to say as a parent, there's no price to get my son back. There's no price. There's a parent. So anything to get him back to there's no price. But I say to people that I'm not only a parent, I'm also part of Kali Shah. Because I need price, I say to them, and if you know that your nephew was going to die to bring your son back, is there, would you pay that price? If you know that a hundred souls would have bring, is there no price? Come on, there's no price. Now, I can't always talk to a person when they're going through the emotional thing. I've also seen the mothers. I can't, I can't tell you the screams of those that, that, you know, we know that some of the girls were raped. And, I, I, you know, I've got a son who's strong and hopefully well. I mean, can you imagine having a woman, you know, I just can't even begin to, you know, imagine what these parents are going to do. I just can't begin to imagine. And, um, and, um, and therefore, you can't judge a person and keep them talking, but if you ask me, and that's part of the complexity of life to carry their both. There's two different wars going on, which overlap. War number one is, it doesn't matter which one is one, which one is two. Number one is to make every single civilian and, host, and, and a soldier home. The most basic responsibility of a people is to, of a country is to protect its civilians and its soldiers. In some way, more soldiers, soldiers are the shikhin, it's the other director of the state. But in other ways, the uh, civilians are not getting to this, they're both important. They're both important. We cannot pull out of Gaza unless every single one of our soldiers, back, including the bodies of Warren Shovel and and uh, and um, uh, Golden, and our Golden, and the other two civilians, Mengistu, uh, Mengistu, we can't pull out without that in my opinion. We have to fight that, and every single one of them comes out. At the same time, how can we have a reality that Hamas can still be in power? God forbid, do this again to us. They've said that they're going to do it. The leaders have said that they're going to do it on October 7th, October 12th, and, then, and for another thousand Octobers. So, is it responsible to be able to, is the price of this to have a ceasefire for whatever with Hamas allow them to do it again? So, so somebody said to me, but how can you be so empathetic one of the rumors to your son's flight? I said to him, I'm not empathetic. I don't love my son any less than anyone else. But part of maturity in life is to say, I'm not only a father. When people say that, I said to them, look at them and say, how many people do you want? Do you want your children's kids to die to bring your son home? Of course we want our son out. And I'll just end, I'll leave you with this thought. Where did I learn this principle? And I was, and all the administrators will know this. When I was head of a school in South Africa for many years, I had a parent who came to me, I had many parents who came to me, the parents who came and were so upset with the decisions we had made. I had one parent who literally wanted to throw the table upside down and shouting and screaming and call me names. No one else has ever, ever called me. I um, actually couldn't believe it. The principal next to me said, did he just call you a Nazi? Is that what he called you? Know? She said, did you just call one of our parents? No, I didn't say that. So you're just behaving like, you know what I mean? You're doing what they call selectia. The son wasn't selected for something. Use this word. She said, I would stop the meeting right now. I said, no, I'm not stopping the meeting right now. I said, I understand where they're coming from. Not, not calling me that, but I understand their pain. I understand their pain, not, not how they're expressing it. Alter and said, I don't have shot car saw. Shouting and screaming and everything. And then I said, afterwards, I said, I understand your pain as a parent. And as a parent, you're doing everything for your child and you shut car. I said, however, as a head of the school, I have to look not only what's good for your child, but a thousand other children. And he 
I will prioritize your child over another child that means I'm doing a disservice to somebody else. And what I have to try and do is to look at all of the shikwili and the considerations and do the best from my vantage point. So I want to say as a parent, I'll turn the dinner table upside down to get our kid out and do a lot of things behind the scenes for him. But as a member of Kali Israel, um, there are other considerations as well. And I do personally rely on the army and the uh, military and the state which will be editing everything get the hostages out and to um, win the war. I know that there's a stir sometimes between that and as I said, when there's a little bit of a stir between that, I say like this, I, said, I would not want to be in their position. I would not want to be in their position. And we have to as parents put as much pressure as we can with the hat of a parent to understand that the shift the, the, the overall considerations are the decision makers, as hard and painful as it is. Um, and uh, that's number one. And number two, uh, I don't want to say that they've got those considerations. Yes, and I said, and I'm sure that they don't, none of those decision makers would like to be in our face. Uh, but I think the basis of empathy is to be able to hold your pain and body point and be able to see another perspective and to empathize with another perspective even if you don't agree with it. So I think the answer is it has to be, I'll just end with this line. Everybody goes for this thing, or oh, oh. Israel is like, oh, oh, oh. you've got to be this, you've got to be that. Or rock, rock, BB, rock, roll, BB, just this, just that. And I say to people, where is it different that there's only one perspective in the Torah? There's many panning to the Torah. There's only one page for a um, the things in the Mahbot. There are different ways of seeing the truth, different ways, depending on your vantage point. And our role, I think, is to look at the world of Gam Both ways, it's difficult, and as I said, maybe for me, the overriding thing is I've seen that our human heart can tolerate Gam Bagam. And maybe I'm Israel can also tolerate Gam Bagam. And if we look at life with a little bit more empathy, a little bit more, it's a beautiful Hebrew, and I will end with a slide, it's a beautiful Hebrew word called Hachalat, the Hachil, it doesn't exist in English. It's something to contain or to accommodate, but in Hebrew it's beautiful. The word Hachala means to find place for everyone. Hachala means, and it should be funny in the Torah, it's place, and that doesn't mean that there are things which aren't beyond, of course there are things beyond the bounds of Torah, that's in every opinion of Israel, obviously, but it doesn't mean that one opinion is right. It means that there's an ability to hold different views and say, no, we, we view the world from different vantage points and they can both be true. Uh, but how can they both be true? You used to drive me crazy when I was your age in your ship. I said, I just want to know what does Hashem want for me? Like, what's the emiss? Don't tell me again, Machnoki. If I hear that word one more time, I don't want to hear that there's different views. But what am I supposed to do? And then, but that's immature. Because life is complex. Life is complex and there's room for both and you've got to find your path of subjective truth within the objective truth. In life, I think the human heart and the heart of the Jewish people need to find a place for different views to cope with the complexity of life. And I think Clyde Israel, I think we've had too long on it. I think it's either this way or that way. So this or that. And, and everyone tries to pull you into a corner and say it doesn't have to be that. It can be gum look up. Ah, but there's a contradiction. You know, we can live with Sarah here. We live with it. And that's the maturity. Of Tzarekiyo, that is what Hashem sometimes we don't have the answers to everything and we can live with the Tzarekiyo. Is what Hashem we hope and pray through all of your two lots and your uh, learning and your smarter and the feeling of Ani Israel together. You should have a later time, is what Hashem. Our son Daniel Shimon should return all the hostages and all of our soldiers should return. Is what Hashem well and help. Thank you very much. Thank
מצרתם, יעצרים בקטר ישוע ויעצר את ניצחון, יחויו בהם הפסוק, יענאו אלוהיכם העולה כמוכם ולוהיכם, יוהכם לכם ומרגיכם, ראשי עשרים אמר אמן.